Okay, so specifically what I'm going to be talking about is how an external attacker can gain access to the internal administrative interface of a lot of these standard consumer grade home routers. Um, first of all though, my employer asked me to put this slide up. Basically stop calling them. I did not do this work for them. I did this work, in fact, before I started working for them. So stop sending your death threats there. Send them to me. <clears throat> All right, so why did I choose home routers as a target? Well, they're easy. Their security is terrible. Um, I, I had like 30 more screenshots I tried to fit on this slide. Just didn't work. Um, and even if you figure, okay, my router doesn't have any bugs in it, which it probably does, um, most people just don't secure them very well. I mean, typically these are people who have no idea how to do anything related to networking or security. So the concept that they will securely configure a network device is just completely flawed. So how does an attacker gain access to the internal web interface of a router? Well, he's not on the LAN. So typically it turns out you can either do it one of two ways, cross-site request forgery or DNS rebinding. Now cross-site request forgery is really the most popular way because it's super simple. But it has a lot of drawbacks, especially when you're going after routers. Um, first of all, there's typically no trust relationship between the client's browser and his router because they never log into their routers. So you can't take advantage of that. Secondly, you can't fake a login if the router uses um, basic authentication. You know, everyone remember how you used to be able to do user colon password at and then URL? Yeah, that doesn't work anymore. Um, IE doesn't even recognize that as a valid URL and Firefox will pop a warning to the user. Um, a lot of routers, well, not a lot of routers, some routers, such as this one that I'm going to be demoing later, actually have anti-cross-site request forgery mechanisms built in. So you can't do cross-site request forgery at all against those. Um, and finally, of course, cross-site request forgery is limited by the same origin policy in the browser. And that's always been its biggest limitation. And if you're not familiar with the same origin policy, basically the browser says, okay, if you browse out to attacker.com and you load up some JavaScript from that site, that JavaScript can interact with any page on attacker.com, but it can't interact with google.com or yahoo.com or 192.168.1.1. And that's good because you don't want some random person's JavaScript interacting with your router, like we'll see later. Um, so that's where DNS rebinding comes in. And DNS rebinding says, okay, if the browser is going to enforce security based on the domain name, let's just tell it that my domain's IP has changed. So the idea is you get someone to browse to your website, load up some JavaScript from attacker.com and then say, oh, attacker.com's IP is now at 192.168.1.1. And the browser says, oh, okay, that's fine. And now that JavaScript can interact with the router. Um, so this has been known for a really long time. Um, DNS rebinding dates back to like 1996. It's really old. And so browsers and um, plugins and everyone have put in these mitigations and band-aids to stop this. But they've never really fixed the actual problem of DNS rebinding, which is a bad security model. Um, and we also have services like OpenDNS, NoScript, and DNS Wall. Um, and basically all, all of these protections are designed to protect your internal network. And the way they do that is they say, okay, if you're an external domain, you shouldn't be resolving to an internal IP address. So they block anything that resolves to an internal IP. So there's a couple ways to do DNS uh, rebinding. The method I'm going to present is my favorite because it's really the slickest of them all, <laughs> I think. Um, and it's better known as DNS load balancing. If we have any DNS admins in here, that's all it is. All right? So if you do a DNS lookup on Google, you don't get one IP address back. You get five. And the reason that is is if you're going to Google on one IP and that IP suddenly goes down, your browser can automatically switch to the next IP address. And so it provides redundancy. Um, but if we try to use this in a rebinding attack, we find that we can't actually use it to rebind to an internal IP address. So let's take a look at rebinding to a public IP first just to see how this works. All right, we have an attacker who has registered the um, domain name attacker.com. He le legitimately owns that. And he has a server located uh, out on the internet with an IP address of 1.4.1.4. Now he wants to attack a public web server that has an IP address of 2.3.5.8. But he doesn't want to di directly connect to that server. So he's going to proxy all of his requests through this random person's browser. And this person's sitting over here behind his firewall feeling 
very safe and secure. So what the attacker does is he has to get that browser to browse out to attacker.com. Well, the browser doesn't know where attacker.com is, so he does a DNS lookup. And the attacker's DNS server says, oh yeah, I have two IP addresses, 1414 and 2358. Now the browser has no way of verifying that. So he just trusts it and says, okay, you've got two IPs, that's fine. So the browser is going to try the first IP address first, which is the attacker's legitimate IP. He's going to do a GET request and the attacker will send back his JavaScript. Now that JavaScript is going to immediately attempt a connection back to attacker.com. Now the browser says, well, you came from attacker.com, you're going to attacker.com. My same origin policy is happy with that. But as soon as the browser attempts that connection back to the 1414 server, that server responds with a TCP reset packet. So now the browser says, crap, that IP is down. Ah, oh, but I have the second IP address. So it immediately switches over to the second IP, which is 2358 sends the request there, and as long as the 2358 server doesn't care that the host header says attacker.com, which unless you're using um, virtual servers on your web browser, you probably don't, it'll just send back the HTML code. So now the attacker's JavaScript has full interactive access to this other website, and he can send requests and see the responses and parse them and send them back to the attacker if he wants to. And this has always worked. And yeah, there are some security implications here for bypassing ACLs and that kind of thing. Um, but the big problem has always been, okay, we don't want people interacting with stuff inside the network. Uh, so let's take a quick look at um, going after the internal IP. So I don't, I don't really care about that 2358 server. That's not what I want. I want 192.168.1.1, which is the router, the client's router. So same scenario as before. Browser browses out to attacker.com and has to do a DNS lookup. And now the DNS server says, oh yeah, I have two IP addresses, 1414 and 192.168.11. Well, the browser says, ah, you have two IP addresses, but one of them is an RFC 1918 non routable IP. So the browser will always try non routable IPs first, regardless of their order in the DNS response. So he's immediately going to just load up the router's web page, which does the attacker no good because the attacker has zero presence in the browser now because the uh, client never made a request out to his server. So you can basically rebind to any public IP you want but not to a private IP. But we can actually leverage this to attack the router because the routers have both a public and a private IP. And to understand how that we can actually accomplish that, let's take a look at how services get bound on the router. This is uh, a screen, well, yeah, a screenshot. <laughs> of uh, a netstat output from an open WRT router. Look at the interfaces. Look at how it's binding to interfaces. It binds to everything. All the services are bound to all interfaces. So these services are actually listening on your WAN interface. But what stops a random person out on the internet for con from connecting directly into them is your firewall rules. And these are very simplified, just what's pertinent to the talk, obviously. Um, but basically this says, okay, my WAN interface is ETH0. So I don't want people connecting in on ETH0. So anything that comes in on ETH0, drop it. And we'll accept everything else because everything else is an internal interface. And there's nothing really wrong with this, but you notice we're again applying security based on a name, the interface name, not based on IP addresses. And where this comes back to bite us is when you look at how the underlying operating system on the router handles IP packets. So RFC 1122 defines two models for implementing uh, an IP stack. The first is the strong model and the second is the weak model. Which do you think is better? <laughs> well, actually the weak model is the more prevalent of the two. Um, it's used by Linux, BSD, and even previous to Windows. So if you take a look at how the weak model works, it says, okay, if I am any host, doesn't matter if you're a router or anything, if you're a host and you have a packet come into you, you look at the destination IP and if that destination IP matches any of your IP addresses on any of your interfaces, accept it and process it. So let's say I get a packet in on, e on ETH0 and the destination IP matches the IP on ETH1, I'll still accept that packet because it's obviously intended for me even though it technically came in on the wrong interface. So let's look at all this in the context of the router. 
you've got a router with two interfaces, internal and external. All right? The external interface is ETH0 with an IP of 2358. So what happens when our internal client tries to browse to 2358? Well, he's going to send a TCP SYN packet to the router because the router is his default gateway. And the router is going to say, ah, well, this destination IP is one of my IP addresses and it's going to port 80. And sure enough, I've got a service listening on port 80. Because remember, the services get bound to all interfaces. So there is, in fact, a service listening on 2358 port 80. And so it completes the three way handshake, and now the browser has connected to the web server on the router using the router's public IP. But we had that firewall rule, remember? The firewall rule that said block everything coming in on ETH0. Why doesn't it block this connection? Well, if you look at the packet capture, the top window is ETH0 and the bottom window is ETH1. That router, that firewall rule that said block everything on ETH0 never got applied because there's never any traffic on ETH0. The logic for the weak end system model occurs pre-routing. So nothing gets routed from ETH1 to ETH0. Everything gets accepted and processed on ETH1 even though technically you're connecting to an IP address that's assigned to ETH0. So ultimately what this means is an internal client can punch in the public IP of their router and get the internal interface. Okay, big deal. He's an internal client. He can access the internal interface anyway. But I as an external attacker can rebind an internal client to any public IP I want, including his router's public IP. So let's take a look at the same attack. But this time, instead of targeting 192.168.1.1, we target 2358. So again, internal client browses to attacker.com and has to do a DNS lookup. Now the DNS server sends back two IP addresses again, 1414 and 2358. So the browser tries 1414 first, attacker sends back his JavaScript. That JavaScript tries to connect back to attacker.com. And now the attacker's server sends back a TCP reset packet, which forces the browser to switch to the 2358 IP, which the router accepts and sends back the HTML code for whatever the request is. So now an external attacker can provide an internal client with JavaScript that has full interactive access to the router's web interface, even though that router has remote administration disabled. So this attack has a lot of advantages. First of all, the rebind is nearly instant. Okay, so if you're doing like an anti-DNS rebinding attack, you have to wait a certain period of time before you can actually do the rebind. Um, I mean, as soon as the browser realizes, it, hey, I got a TCP reset packet, it switches over to the next IP. We also don't have to know the router's internal IP address, which is really nice because, you know, different vendors will have different default IPs and people can change their internal uh, network and that kind of things. But we don't care about the internal IP because we're rebinding to the public IP, which by definition is public, so we can get that pretty easily. And finally, this is just how browsers work. This works in all major browsers. Um, but the downside is we have some very specific requirements for the router. So the router basically has to have three requirements. It has to bind its web service to the WAN interface. Um, the firewall rules have to be based on interface name or some other configuration. Uh, that basically does the same thing. Um, and it has to implement the weak end system model and its underlying IP stack. So not all routers are going to be vulnerable to this. Um, I went ahead and tested 30 routers. It worked against 17 of them. Uh, and that includes stuff from Asus, Belkin, Dell, which I didn't know they made routers, but apparently they do. Um, Thompson, which if everyone here is from the UK, these are pretty popular over there. Um, I didn't get a chance to test the BT Home Hub, which is also really popular over there, um, but it's a rebranded Thompson, so there's a good possibility it'll work against that as well. Um, lots of Linksys. This worked against a lot of Linksys devices. And I really like this slide because those bottom two routers, uh, the 54GL and the uh, WRT160N, are, on, are both on Amazon's top five most popular selling routers list. Awesome. Um, so a lot of people put third-party firmware on their Linksys routers, especially 54Gs, and it works against those too. Um, now I will, in PF Sense's defense, I will say they actually contacted me like a month ago when they saw this talk up on the Black Hat page and the DEF CON pages, and uh, they actually have fixed this now. 
They have anti-DNS 